September 4th meeting of the Columbia Rotary Club. Um, we have a very small crowd right now, but I think everybody's going to be filtering in. There's apparently a perfect storm train um, blocking all access to this side, so uh, we'll have some stragglers coming in, but we're going to go ahead and get started with our national anthem.
see none. Thank you. Hope everyone has a great Rotary Week. We asked Rusty to come up here uh, for health and happiness, but um, I heard from Libby this morning, and I know we've got a lot of Rotarians who are ringing the bell right now. Um, you know, things got into full swing, especially at Greens this week. She said uh, to inform her captains, if you have not filled all of your spaces for this week, please let her know as soon as possible because she can uh, get the Salvation Army to fill those spaces in for you. And so if you have some slots that are not yet filled, please let her know as soon as possible. It does take a little bit of time uh, to make that happen. And also, Jennifer Harding, who's visiting us again from um, the Spring Valley Rotary Club, she's out front. Um, she'll be out front after the meeting, and she's selling the, um, the pecans, or the pecans, however you say it. Um, she's selling those uh, today, which make fantastic Christmas gifts. and. Um, so support St. Um, Spring Valley Rotary Club if you get a chance. And so now I'm going to ask Rusty to pass, to come on up here and do health and happiness. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, I am uh, delighted to uh, see so many of you here, and I would like to uh, take a uh, take a quick poll and find out uh, how many people in this uh, audience like trains. <laughs> I despise trains. I've always despised trains. Um, I used to go to school in Virginia back during my high school years, and I had to get up at o dark thirty and go to Charlotte to get a train that stopped at every crossroads between Charlotte, North Carolina and Orange, Virginia. Um, it took all day on the train. I think we left at 7 o'clock in the morning. We got there about 5.30 in the afternoon. Um, that is, um, that's a rough way to travel. No question about it. Um, I know absolutely nothing about the membership because I was out there on Rosewood Drive um, waiting for that infernal train to, uh, which wasn't even moving. You know, if the thing were moving, that'd be one thing, but it didn't even move for about 20 minutes. And uh, uh, anyway, so I do have uh, I do have a few little uh, things that I hope you'll find amusing. Um, and uh, gosh, I. My wife, I was running over these things with my wife, and she said, you know, with all this uh, with all this sexual harassment stuff going around, you know, you better be careful uh, what you do. I had uh, I had asked her if she knew where the blonde wig was, since it was referred to the other day. Uh, I thought I would wear the blonde wig today, but we can't find it. So uh, um, I suspect Susan threw it away, but uh, I don't know that. Um, you know, uh, since it's football season, uh, and I want you to know, is Adam uh, Jordan here? Good. I'm glad he's not here. Uh, I had to uh, I had to email Adam over the weekend and tell him that we could no longer be friends until uh, after the first of January. Um, Adam, of course, uh, you know, is a uh, graduate of the University of Alabama. Roll time. And, uh, oh, gracious goodness, I'm telling you what's the truth. Um, and, uh, and then I, I also noticed, uh, Susan gave me this article to read about uh, Will Gillespie and, uh, and, and his wife, and they are both uh, graduates of the University of Alabama. Uh, and uh, so I guess I can't go to that Outback place on Divine Street anymore either. Um, <clears throat> at least until after the game is over. But, uh, uh, since it's football season, uh, I wanted to remind you that uh, Don Meredith, uh, who was the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, once said that Tom Landry, Coach Tom Landry, is such a perfectionist that if he were married to Raquel Welch, he would expect her to cook. Uh, John, John Breen of the Houston Lawyers. Um, Said that uh, he said we were we were tipping off our plays. Whenever we broke from the huddle, three backs were laughing, and one was pale as a ghost. <laughs> um, 
then uh, Bone Phillips, the New, the New Orleans Saints, after viewing a lopsided loss to the Atlanta Falcons, he said the film looks suspiciously like the game itself. <laughs> um, on uh, uh, one Sunday, in counting the money in the weekly offering, uh, the pastor of a small Florida church found a pink envelope containing a thousand dollars. It happened again the following week. The following Sunday, he watched as the offering was collected and saw a little old lady put a distinctive pink envelope in the plate. This went on for weeks, and finally the pastor, overcome by curiosity, approached her. Ma'am, I couldn't help but notice that you put $1,000 a week in the collection plate. Why, yes, she replied, every week my son sends me some money, and I give some of it to the church. The pastor replied, well, that's wonderful. How much does he send you? The old lady said, $10,000 a week. <laughs> the pastor was amazed. Your son is very successful. What does he do for a living? He's a veterinarian, she answered. Uh, that's an honorable profession, the pastor said. Where does he practice? She, the old lady said proudly, in Nevada. He has two cat houses in Las Vegas and one in Reno. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, we've all heard these uh, these things about it. That's when the fight started. Uh, I, I have to say, though, I, I do think that some of these are um, are funny. I hope that these will be one some that you have not heard before. Uh, <clears throat> my this applies, I think, especially in my house. My wife sat down next to me as I was flipping channels. She asked, what's on TV? I said, lots of dust. Then the fight started. <laughs> um, I took my wife to a restaurant. The waiter, for some reason, took my order first. Uh, I'll have the rump steak rare, please. He said, aren't you married to, uh, aren't you worried about the mad cow? No, she can order for herself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is perhaps my favorite. My wife, my wife was at her high school reunion, uh, and since since then I went to her 50th high school reunion uh, just this fall. Uh, my wife was at her high school reunion, and she kept staring at this drunk swigging his drink as he sat alone at a nearby table. So I finally asked her. I said, "Do you know him?" Uh, yeah, she said, he's my old boyfriend. He began drinking right after we split up years ago and hasn't been sober since. My God, I said, who would think that a person could go on celebrating for that long? <laughs> and then the fight started. <laughs> now you realize, of course, that these are not true. They do not apply to me. <laughs> That's all I need is for somebody to pick up the phone and tell Susan why I just... <laughs> my wife, well, let me not use that. Uh, I have, a friend of mine told me, he said, I had a blind date last night, but I was concerned, what do I do if she's really unattractive? I'll be stuck with her all night. Turns out there's an app for that. Did you know that? There's an app for that. It's called Mom, Are You Okay? It schedules your phone to ring just five or six minutes after you meet the girl. <clears throat> and if you like her, you ignore it. If you want to cut the date short, you answer with, Mom, what's the matter? Are you okay? Make an excuse citing your mother's sudden health scare and bone. It works every time. So I knocked on the girl's door. Turns out I didn't, I needn't get worried. She was gorgeous. I couldn't get over how attractive she was. It took me a few minutes to realize that I was in for a real good time. Just as I was about to speak to her, her phone rang. She answered and said, Mom, what's the matter? Are you okay? Wow, Vance, you got to follow that up. <laughs> All right, um, one quick thing. Everybody hold up the cart buckets on your tables. We all came in late. So don't forget to put something in the card bucket, buckets, please. And uh, we're going to go ahead and um, get started with our speaker, with uh, Vance Eaton, who's going to introduce him.
Thank you, Carrie. My name is Van Team. Um, it is my real pleasure to introduce to y'all my friend and former colleague, uh, Joseph Healy Shinkar. He goes by Joe, but he allows me to call him Healy, which is his name in Hebrew. I'm, I'm certain that I pronounce it incorrectly, uh, as it should sound in Hebrew, but he lets me call him that anyway. And I want to tell you a little bit about about Healy. He is the legal counsel for the Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services. He's a former prosecutor and used to work with me at the Fifth Circuit Solicitor's Office, uh, where we try cases together. And where Healy, in addition to uh, prosecuting crimes of all different types, became very interested in the opioid crisis that this country is, is going through. He single-handedly, when he was at our office, uh, got an enormous grant uh, to South Carolina and pass some legislation um, to outfit law enforcement with uh, something that he knows much more about than I do, but it's called naloxone, and it's an antidote for people who are overdosing. Um, and he, he really did more than I think anybody in the state, even when he was a prosecutor, uh, at addressing this problem. Um, he left our office in August of this year to go be the uh, uh, legal counsel for Deotis. I'll go through some of his accomplishments real quickly. Uh, he went and started at Midlands Tech. <clears throat> uh, from Midlands Tech, he transferred to the University of South Carolina, where he got a BA in Religious Studies, um, and then went on to the University of South Carolina for law school, where he got his JP. He, as I mentioned, was a prosecutor. That is now legal counsel at Deotis. He uh, has published a number of things to include uh, a state plan to prevent and treat prescription drug abuse. In the South Carolina Lawyer Magazine, he published Back from the Dead, A Breath of Hope for South Carolina, which is about naloxone. Um, he's also published in the journal of the South Carolina Medical Association. Uh, Helix is uh, the past, immediate past chair of the South Carolina All Pharmacy Conference and runs the naloxone training program. Um, Helix is my sometime workout buddy. Uh, I lift about as much as he does. <laughs> that statement does not pass the four-way test. <laughs> He'll point out to you that I've been very absent from the gym lately, but Helix, with the onset of holiday eating, I, I will be getting back into the gym with you, I promise. Um, you know, in addition to his accomplishments as a prosecutor, Helix is just also kind of, he's an inspiring person. And I'll just tell you very briefly that Helix is uh, from Israel um, and lived in an orphanage, actually, in Israel. Came to the United States at age 20 with not much more than a shirt on his back and very little English. Um, you know, when I think about my friend Helix, I think of a person that not only took advantage of opportunity, but also decided to serve and to give back to, to his community and to this country. So with that, I'm very proud to welcome Helix Shankar to our club. So now we have to say I am from around here. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this afternoon and talk to you about a very, very serious issue. Um, I'm glad that we had a chance to laugh a little bit about it because what you're about to see and hear is not very pretty and it's a troublesome trend that we've been having in South Carolina that's um, it's going to continue to be a major, major problem. As Vince indicated, um, I used to be a prosecutor. I prosecuted in my tenure at the solicitor's office and with the U.S. Attorney's Office, what we call the drug diversion docket. These are all the pharmaceutical drugs that made their way to the illicit market in shape and form. And that's how we came acquainted with prescription drugs and opioids and figuring out what's going on with this problem in South Carolina. And over the years, I really saw this issue developing from just a problem into a full-blown epidemic. 
And um, as Vince mentioned, when opportunity came um, to work with Iodas about finding some solutions, I did not hesitate and took on the opportunity to do so, and I believe that we will be doing some good things. Now, um, we'd like to recognize what we even started. On one hand, I did not pass any legislation. Okay? I helped draft the legislation, but we do have someone here in um, the audience today, Representative Chief Huggins, who, and we're going to talk about the stuff that he did later, um, is really the person that you all should stop by and thank uh, on your way out as the father of what, what I like to call the um, the most effective piece of legislation ever to be moved in South Carolina related to the opioid crisis. That is the South Carolina Disease Prevention Act. Um, so, as we go through this, I would like to uh, deliver some of the information that I have, I have gained through the years. I hope that you will receive it in the right way. There is a very controversial aspect to the opioid problem. And what I'm presenting today is the mindset that is scientifically based. I understand people hold their own opinions, matters, especially when it comes to addiction. Working for the agency in South Carolina that's supposed to provide the infrastructure to deal with addiction, I can only tell you what is scientifically based. Okay? So if you don't agree with something that I present, that's okay. Um, but that is what the methods that we are going to be used or going to be using in order to try to alleviate some of these concerns. As Representative Huggins will tell you, and Representative Benningfield, who chairs the House Special Study uh, Special Opioid Study Committee, this is a people's problem. This is not a problem that government can solve. All that we can do is really try to provide some infrastructure for solutions. And then we want the people to come in and take care of this problem. So with that being said, let's go through and describe what's going on in South Carolina nowadays. So, drug overdoses are currently the leading cause of accidental death in the United States with over 62,000 overdose deaths in 2016, which is an average of about eight and a half, uh, per, uh, eight, uh, one person per, per eight and a half minutes. That already surpassed deaths that came from motor vehicle accidents. And in South Carolina, we are well within the track to surpass that trend and within the next couple of years. In 2016, there were 5.2 million opioid prescription dispensed in South Carolina, but our population total is about 4.9. That is prescription medication that is opioid, either um, oxycodone, oxycontin, hydrocodone, that can kill an individual, and we have more prescriptions than population. That is not including the unfold enormous number of uh, heroin and other illicit drugs that make their way into, the, into South Carolina that are not even calculated into this particular statistic. And in 2016, just to compare, we had 366 murders in South Carolina, <coughs> while we had 616 overdose deaths. And those are 616 of South Carolina residents. We, in fact, had a little bit more than 700. The transient individuals who ended up coming here from North Carolina, from New Jersey, from any other state, who overdosed and died in our state, we don't get to claim them on our stats. The respective states where they are residents, they will take the stats uh, for their deaths. So, in fact, we had a lot more than just 616. How does that look in a map? Horry County, over 100 individuals have died. We have seen an increase through the years. From 2014, we had 508 overdose deaths. 2015, 565, and now we are at 616. And that trend is increasing. Um, some of the counties have doubled and tripled in the overdose deaths that we have seen in the last couple of years. Before we go into more statistics, I want to tell you a little bit about what uh, Vince mentioned, that medication, Narcan, also known as Naloxone. And it's important because the next slide is relevant to the medication itself. So what do we have here in South Carolina that, and elsewhere in the United States that can help us? That is this particular medication. It's, you can call it a wonder drug. It's a very benign drug that all it does is kick out those opioids from the brain because the, the Narcan uh, molecules have greater affinity to the opioid receptors in the brain. So basically what it does is temporarily reverses the effect of opioids on the body. Obviously a person still needs to be taken to the hospital, still needs to be treated. 
Uh, the medication itself is also known as naloxone, and it was approved in 1971 by the FDA. So it's been around for quite a while, and um, it's been shown to be very effective and very uh, beneficial for cases involving opioids uh, overdoses. It's a medication of choice in emergency care of opioid overdoses. It's only effective on opioids. It, is not, it does not have any effect on benzodiazepines, like Valium and Xanax, not on alcohol, or not on meth. And it has little more side effect other than the reversal of opioids. So if you heard, for example, about people vomiting or having nausea because of the Narcan that they are given, it is not because of the medication itself. In fact, what happens, once a person receives the medication, it kicks out the opioids from the brain and they go into withdrawal. It is the withdrawal from opioids that creates this reaction of vomiting and nausea. But the medication itself is very, very safe. So why am I telling you about Narcan? Because in South Carolina, every EMS encounter with a patient has to be recorded or reported uh, electronically within 24 to 48 hours. The University of North Carolina in Chapel, Hill, in Chapel Hill houses that entire database that generates over 1.3 million reports a year. Why is it important to us? Because that, this way we can track how many Narcan administrations have been given by EMS so we can see the magnitude of the problem. So here is a 2015 map of, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that you can see the numbers, but Horry County had a little bit more than 500, um, and Greenville County had a few hundreds as well. Bottom line is that there were 4,600 individuals who were treated. You have to register that these 4,600 individuals that were treated with Narcan could have died if they had not been treated with the medication. So we're looking at 616 overdose deaths, but in fact, if we did not have Narcan in our uh, possession to administer to these folks, we would be looking at 5,200 deaths in 2015. Fast forward one year, and it looks like an epidemic. The red zones have increased all across South Carolina. Horry County doubled for over 1,000 um, of administration of Narcan, and we now have treated 6,400 individuals, which is a 39% increase in one year. Moving forward to this current year, this is a heat map of everyone in South Carolina, and we've already seen an increase of 10% from last year. So, all in all, uh, as we're talking about 16, 17,000 individuals in three years that have been affected by this problem that could have, I mean, with the type of substances that we have out there, there is a great likelihood that they all would have been dead if we did not have Narcan. <coughs> So let's talk about the stigma. Who are these people that you think that are overdosing? Everybody has this mindset in their head, or we all know that, you know, John is a heroin addict, um, overdosing over and over and over again, causing problems in the community, because with drug addiction and drug abuse, there comes a criminal element. But when we started gathering the stats, what we realized that over the three years period, only two to three percent of the individuals were actually their peers. The vast majority, about 97% of the people who were treated with Narcan, were first timers. What does that mean? That means that every year we have new people that are brought into the fold of addiction. These are not your neighborhood uh, bomb that is just walking around and overdosing and looking for the next heroin hit. These are kids that are experimenting with stuff that kills them. And I know the representative audience will be able to tell you stories about what's going on in Irma and as many other people who are involved with their communities will be able to tell you what's going on elsewhere in South Carolina. So it's a very sad thing to know that only 2 to 3% of the individuals are actually the peers. And when you look at the stats, you look how many people overdose two times versus three times versus four times versus five times, you see that the numbers drop exponentially. For twice, we had about 498 repeaters, but after that, you don't get another chance. Third time repeaters are very rare, Full-time repeaters, even rarer than that. So the reason is because the type of potency of substances that we have on the streets are just killing everybody. And these people don't get another chance to overdose and die or to be treated. They die before they can be treated. Other useful information to know about these trends, um, the days of the week, usually the weekends, are more likely to see overdoses than uh, during the weekend. During the summer time of the year, between June and August, people are more likely to overdose than anywhere, anytime, any other time during the year. 
So while we are here, how did we get to the point where these scores of individuals just died? And these are, like I said, these are kids. These are not um, 50, 60 year old individuals. These are 20, 30 year old kids that have their entire life ahead of them. How did we get to this point? So we must ask ourselves the right kind of questions in order to be able to deliver the right kind of answers. If we are going to look at drug addiction as a moral failure and nothing else, then we are limited by the kind of solutions that we can find. But if we are going to try to inquire about it and see if there's anything else that we can do, our base of solutions increases. Now, not everything is going to work, but we have more solutions that we can bring into the table. So let's talk a little bit about opioids. What are opioids? Uh, some people know them as opiates, some people know them as opioids. There used to be a distinction between the two. Nowadays, everything is classified under opioids. Opiates used to be opium derivative drugs, and um, opioids used to be synthetic. They just mimic the same reaction that the opiates do. But now, because we have such a great variety of them, everything is classified as opioids. Uh, so if you hear that, it's used interchangeably. So there are class of drugs that is chemically similar to opium patterns. And these drugs act on the central nervous system. And what they do, they decrease the perception of pain, they decrease the reaction to pain, and they increase pain tolerance. So they all work in the brain. So if you get an injury, if you sever your finger, it's not that the drug goes to the severed area, it goes into your brain and then create all of these effects on the brain so you will not feel the pain. It is prescribed for acute, debilitating, or chronic pain, or as part of palliative care like hospice. And obviously it may be abused to um, um, produce some kind of euphoria, euphoria or a high. And that is what heroin and stuff like that is doing. So how did we find ourselves in this situation? The wisest of all men, King Salman, said before in Ecclesiastic that there is nothing new under the sun. History has a tendency to repeat itself. And mankind's love affair with the um, a morphine molecule is nothing new. It has been happening for the generations. So it's important to us in this forum to understand how did we get over here and what kind of lessons we learned from the past. So just by way of a brief history, uh, opioids, uh, the first reference is as old as 3,400 um, years ago, or not years ago, but 5,400 years ago. Uh, in Mesopotamia, it was known as the uh, plant of joy. Uh, it was then um, moved through Mesopotamia, through the Silk Roads, into uh, the Far East, and um, into China. Uh, no, notably, the, the one in, event I wanted to bring in that is kind of like important in the history is the Opium Wars in China. Those are two incidents. Uh, that took place between England and China, uh, where the Chinese were complaining that the British were importing illegal opium from India into China, and thereby causing a major social disruption where people were getting addicted to it and would not be able to work, and people were dying. And I found it to be very interesting that nowadays, what we see in the United States is China importing illegal drugs into the United States, causing the same kind of disruption. Um, morphine was isolated in uh, 1805. Uh, that's important because uh, morphine is about 10 times more potent than opium is. And coupled that with the invention of the hypodermic needle, the Civil War in the United States was the first testing ground for the deadly combination. So the, fall, the, the war was fought during the convergence of these two inventions, the morphine and the hypodermic needle. But the result is that in the battlefield, a lot of soldiers were treated with morphine intravenously. And that created a huge uh, or a huge number of addicted individuals uh, after the war. They used to call it soldier disease. Uh, these soldiers would actually try to attack the reserves where they would keep the morphine, and they had to guard it constantly. But what that resulted in the United States, about 80 to 100,000 individuals were addicted to morphine right after the war. And then we have the Bell Company um, bringing heroin into the United States legally. Um, that's um, in the late 1800s when heroin was invented and uh, was purified for morphine. And by the 1914, the Harrison Narcotics and Tax Act uh, made it very difficult for anyone to import 
um, narcotics into the United States. Heroin itself was abolished in 1924, um, and then gave us about 60 years of relative um, uh, careful practice, prescribing practices by physicians. But all of it changed in the 80s. This particular article that was published in the New, York, um, in the New England Journal uh, put forward the, um, the starting gun for this opioid epidemic to hit. What it did, and I don't know if you can read it, it says that it was very rare to find opioid addiction in patients who received treatment in the hospital. And this article examined uh, uh, treatment over 11,000 patients. What happened is that this article was so limited um, and so insignificant in the sense that uh, it only treated people who came to the hospital, it only treated them once and uh, not over a long period of time, but Big Pharma seized on the opportunity and in 1996 when uh, Oxycontin was introduced by Purdue Pharma, they built on that notion that opioids are not addictive and that people do not get addicted to them and that it's not likelihood that they will be developing any kind of addiction to opioids. You add up the pain scale that was added uh, in 2001, asking patients to chart their pain in order to um, uh, tell the doctors that how they feel, and it became the fifth vital sign. So now pain could not have been ignored anymore, and patients had to be treated for their pain issues. In the late 90s, black tar heroin started making an entry in the United States from Mexico, and then in 2010, there was the rise of the synthetic opioids. In this particular picture, you can see how potent some of the synthetic opioids are by comparison of weight. So if you have a heroin that is uh, purified heroin without any mixing it, and you try to compare it to carfentanil, which is an elephant tranquilizer, uh, you will see that one grain is equal to about um, as many as you can see with the heroin bottle. Um, that is the deadly trend that we see right now. Most of the deaths that we have seen in the last few years are all attributed to the mixing of heroin with synthetic opioids. So what happens is that when somebody is uh, injecting heroin intravenously, they are not just injecting heroin, there's carfentanil, there's um, substances that don't even have a name, like U47700, which is an experimental drug that was created in a university environment, was found not to be suitable for medical use, but then got adopted by Chinese, rogue Chinese chemists, and now being produced on a mass scale. All of these substances are in South Carolina. Do not fool yourself thinking that we are some kind of uh, insulated for, to this issue. Uh, we have seen it in the last few years, and I can tell you that the SLED lab, which does the majority of the uh, chemical testing of substances in South Carolina, is terrified. And we had to train there with Narcan because of possible exposure within the lab. So how do opioids affect the brain? So after talking about a little bit about the history, we've been there before, we are going to be here again. And by the way, we will surpass this epidemic as well. It's one day going to be done, it may take 5, 10, 15 years down the road, um, and it will, be, it will be over, and nothing lasts forever. The big question that we need to ask ourselves is how many people are going to die between now and then, and if there's anything that we can do to prevent some of these deaths. So how do opioids affect the brain? So opioid molecules latch onto receptors in the brain. Those are the delta, kappa, and the mu receptors. Those receptors are the ones that are in charge in producing this euphoric effect or the numbing of the pain. Use, turn into abuse, turn into addiction. And I was telling uh, uh, earlier uh, in my, one of my conversations that in my days as a prosecutor, I would see that day in and day out. People who come into court who are addicted to heroin, who up until two years ago were productive members of society, had a good job, a family, pay taxes, and they were just, you know, just like you and me. And there was nothing bad about them. And then two years down the road, they were shot all themselves uh, strolling into the courtroom high and not able to take care of themselves homeless and on, living on the streets and without a job, without a family and lost pretty much everything in their life. And how did they get to that point from being a productive member to a point of being prosecuted and being sent to jail? And that is how it's done. People get injured, get ungodly amount of opioids prescribed to them, then they start using it. They do not think that it's going to be addictive. They do not know about the addictive properties of opioids. And after a month or two or three months of using it, they get hooked on it. And the doctors will prescribe it, but at some point the doctor will win them off or will cut off the prescription. 
What do they do then? They go to the next uh, best alternative. They may go doctor shopping and try to see multiple doctors to get the same medication, or they will turn to the streets, try to get prescription drugs um, from somebody uh, that has been diverted, that uh, were stolen, or um, were not have an alcohol from the real prescription drug. And if they cannot find that, they will turn into heroin. And that's how they end up tangled, get all tangled up with the judicial system and end up going to jail. So use of, uh, let's do abuse, let's do addiction. There is a measurable physiological change to the brain. So as we're talking about the difference between a moral choice and how we treat a disease, when we talk about opioids over a long period of time, there is a measurable change to the brain chemistry. What does it mean? It means that those opioid receptors that are in charge of giving us the numbing of the pain, they get blocked after a while. This is why people need to increase their dosages. They get the body get adjusted to it, and they need to increase. Once those reach maximum capacity, the brain, which is a wonderful thing, starts multiplying those receptors and create new ones. So what we do have now is a definitely changed person with a different brain chemistry, just like a person with a disease would be. So somebody with high cholesterol would have a situation where they cannot control it, might be genetic, it might be due to eating habits, but that body has changed from having a proper cholesterol to a point of having a high cholesterol. And that's how we measure the addiction to opioids with um, individuals, is the chemical change to the brain. This is why when people go into uh, abstinence-based treatment, a lot of times they will go into withdrawal, because those brain receptors that are now existing in the brain, they don't go anywhere. And when a person stops abruptly, taking those medication, um, then they go into withdrawal effects, which are quite horrible. Uh, they feel like their entire body is on fire. They feel that uh, their bones are crushing in within the body. And a lot of people are actually afraid to get incarcerated and will cooperate with law enforcement because they do not want to go into withdrawal within the jail because that is the most horrible thing that they can experience. So they're so worried about it, as soon as they get arrested, they will immediately cooperate with law enforcement because they do not want to go into withdrawal within the jail walls. So what can be done to treat this kind of a beast? It is a beast. Um, how can we do it? Well, we have to take a holistic approach to it. All hands on deck. We gotta use every tool that we have in our box to try to make this thing work. And in my opinion, no one tool is better than the other, but we all have to accept that there are different approaches to different solutions. And if I were to compare this to cholesterol again, some people with high cholesterol will be just fine with an adequate diet and exercise. Um, some people may need a little bit more than that. We will need a medication. So abstinence-based treatment like NAA and faith-based rehab are all great, but they are not fitting for everyone. We need medication-assisted treatment. That is methadone, buprenorphine, and naltroxone. So full agonists, partial agonists, and antagonists, those are all kinds of treatments. So uh, methadone provides a full reaction, just like heroin would provide. But uh, methadone is a longer-acting opioid. So a person will not go into withdrawal for another 24 to 36 hours. Unlike a short-acting opioid like heroin, where the high is over, the person goes into withdrawal immediately. <coughs> We need to have gel diversion. We need to get people to treatment out of gel as soon as possible. We need most treatment centers to provide medication-assisted treatment. And we need to have access to Narcan. So we have a major turning point. And as I mentioned, Representative Haggis is here. In 2015, he introduced the South Carolina Overdose Prevention Act. The act seeks blood immunity from both civil and criminal liability to any doctors, pharmacists, caregivers, and first responders who are engaged in the prescription, dispensation, and administration of Narcan in an opioid over the suspected case. The legislature expanded the act last year and now allowed for any individual to walk off the street to any pharmacy and obtain the drug without any uh, prescription. So you do not have to go see a doctor in order to get a medication. Well, hindsight is always 2020. We realized a year later that no heroin addicts are walking into pharmacies to spend $30 copay to buy Narcan. If they have that money, they are spending it on buying heroin. So what can we do and what can the owners do to help alleviate this problem? 
So, with regards to access to Narcan, as Vance mentioned, we created the South Carolina um, Law Enforcement Officer Narcan Training Program, which is training police officers in how to identify overdose cases and how to administer Narcan. We deployed it in June of 2016, and it's a two-hour block training, and we train approximately 4,000 police officers from 40 counties in the state. Um, and as of a week ago, we had 151 administrations. In fact, this past weekend we had four. So I think we are up to 158. These are police officers who are engaged in a medical procedure in the field. They are administering a drug. That's how serious the problem is. We had to travel all over the state and convince these police officers that this is a serious problem. And now when it means to protect and serve, it means to administer a drug. We are enrolling a similar program with the fire departments uh, to provide them with Narcan. Um, and we provide Narcan to patients and recoveries that go to one of the 32 facilities that are being supported by the ODS, those are service providers. And the biggest, uh, the big ticket item for this coming year is community distribution. Um, I have testified before the House Special Study Committee on Opioids on this issue. We are going to uh, propose moving Narcan from a pharmacy-only uh, situation into allowing any, any organization that deals with treatment to addiction to acquire the drug directly from the manufacturer at a reduced market, market price so they can give it to people who they come in contact with. So harm reduction coalitions, <coughs> churches that have NA and AA meetings, People who come in contact with heroin addicts on a daily basis will now be able to acquire the medication without having to go to our pharmacies and then give the medication to these people who daily need it and who com comprise a large number of these 616 overdose deaths that you have seen. In the field of medication assisted treatment, methadone for pregnant women to reduce the risk of fatal overdosing on opioids for mom and baby. Again, we wanna have a two-fold purpose here. Give them a long-acting opioids versus a short-acting opioids like um, heroin that might be mixed with fentanyl that can kill both the baby and the mom. We're going to give them something to keep them going on so they can keep the baby safe until the baby is born. It's controversial, but the idea of keeping a baby alive is an utmost importance at this point, especially for pregnant women. Medication Assistant Treatment Court, that's a new project that I'm working on. We now have a gap. A lot of you may be familiar with the fact that we have drug courts in South Carolina. But when you think about it, when a person gets incarcerated, there is a gap of four to seven months from the point of incarceration to the point that a drug court plea become possible. What are we doing for those four to seven months? Especially in the case of severe opioid addiction, when people need stabilization almost immediately. So this initiative is going to close the gap. In fact, I'm living here after this presentation to go to your county to discuss the matter with the uh, uh, solicitor bracket to see we are looking for uh, to establish uh, some pilot programs across the state. And we have identified federal funding that we'll be able to bring in to support these programs. We started a VV tour project with the Department of Corrections. I know that I'm running a little bit late on my time here, and I'll try to get it short, but Vivitrol is an antagonist, so basically it blocks the entire receptors. So a person would not use, uh, or even if they use heroin or any other opioids, they will not have the effects on the brain um, with the Vivitrol being given as a shot. We are trying to create a re-entry program for people who put the Department of Corrections who are about to finish their sentences and go back into the community. Their chances of relapsing and going back to drug use are pretty high, and we want to make that a little bit more uh, possible for them to get integrated back into the community. Community paramedicine, send EMS personnel uh, that cleared an individual to the hospital for an overdose two or three days later to check on that person, take their vitals, give them some uh, literature about addiction, about where to get um, treatment. We found that uh, similar projects like that elsewhere, especially in Appalachia region, uh, were proven to be pretty uh, um, successful, where people are going to treatment because somebody cares about them, somebody's fully adapting them, somebody showing them that there is hope that they can do better. Disposal of unused prescription drugs, we have a huge problem with that. The, the others is working with the White House and the EPA uh, to try to roll back some regulations 
that were created back in 2012 that now are hindering our ability to dispose of these prescription drugs in a very fast manner. And awareness. We just finished the Governor's Opioid Summit in August of 2017. We had over 600 participants, and it was a great summit for two days. Um, and it was a good collaborative effort to see law enforcement and the medical world and treatment world come together to discuss this problem to try to find solutions. Statewide media campaign that's starting in January of, ne uh, of next year. Um, this is a, uh, a multi million dollar campaign that the OLS has been uh, uh, working on to increase awareness that opioids can kill you. Other areas that we've been working in collaboration with, uh, we want to bring synthetic opioids within the trafficking statute. Right now, a person that carries a kilo of carfentanil cannot be charged with trafficking. And it is amazing to me that if they have four grams of opium in its raw form, they can be charged with trafficking, but they cannot with a kilo of carfentanil. Uh, so we need to address this issue. We need to give law enforcement the tools that they need to deliver the blow to criminal organizations that traffic the substances into the state of South Carolina. Emergency schedule by DHEC. We need to be able to allow the Department of Health and Environmental Control to schedule, to have a rapid mechanism by which new schedules can be, uh, new substances can be scheduled because it has a direct effect on how law enforcement can make arrests. If the substance is not scheduled, law enforcement cannot arrest these individuals because technically speaking, the substance is not illegal. And then, we want to increase collaboration between EMS and law enforcement in the reporting and investigation of overdoses. So we've been partnering with uh, federal HIDA uh, teams, so those are the high impact drug trafficking area team. We have one in South Carolina to provide tools how law enforcement and EMS can talk to each other without violating HIPAA laws to better investigate and better identify overdose situations. So that's what we've been engaged with is uh, playful, um, but we are up for the challenge. We've been working very hard at it, and we appreciate your support in inviting me to speak about it. Like I said, it's a very serious issue. And um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call or email me. Um, you all have my information, and I'll be happy to hear any kind of comments and suggestions. We always want to make it better. One question. One question. Yes, sir. You did, uh, I think, on 60 Minutes. I mean, there was a thing up in New Hampshire. And I remember they were interviewing the first responders and fire department, and the Narcan using that was beginning to consume the entire budget yep. of the uh, county, city, whatever it was, just doing Narcan. And I, I, I like to speak about that. So we don't want to plaster the problem because we don't put like a mandate on it, and you just give Narcan left and right. We have to have a plan at hand. We have to. Provide Narcan because that's the only tool that can reverse somebody's life. We are not going to prevent a person who's having a heart attack from that medication, uh, even though we're going to put it on a plan later on how to not get again uh, into a condition where they're suffering from a heart attack. Uh, but at, at that point in time, we have to provide the medication as human being to human being. When we are standing in front of that person and they're about to die, they're circling the drain, um, as we call it in our training, FTDs, uh, fixing to die. Um, we want to be able to provide uh, one opportunity for them to make it back and then maybe, maybe just maybe, change the uh, attitude where we can, or change their lifestyle, where we can provide them the tools to do so. So just providing Narcan in and of itself, that's right, it's not a solution, but it has to come with a lot of other things, a lot of other tools together to provide that kind of a solution. and um, talk to everybody afterwards, so we're going to go ahead and let him um, hit the road. But Representative Huggins said that he would stick around if anybody has questions. Um, he's right over here and, and, and can take your questions. Um, we're, we're not going to end with song because we're over time right now, but I hope everybody has a wonderful week. Joe, thank you so much. Fantastic.